Well, hi there. What do you get if you cross a cave troll, a bearded dragon, a scorpion, and a sarcastic fringe head? Well, as far as I can tell, you get these toad-headed agamas from Asia and the Middle East. At first glance, these look like, well, usually at first glance it looks like a box full of sand. But when you manage to catch these guys above ground, they look pretty much like a little bearded dragon with the face of a cave troll. It isn't until they get excited, or perhaps a little bit startled, that you see the scorpion tail curl. And perhaps, if you get really lucky, the sarcastic fringe head crazy mouth defensive display. I'm not sure there is a crazier defensive display in any other lizard. It is the reptile world's answer to the Venus flytrap. But like I said, a lot of the time, if you look into their enclosure at first glance, all you will see is sand. At least until you look a bit more carefully. Playing Find the Agamas is a very fun game indeed. Because most of the time, if you look hard enough, you can find them. And the rad way that they bury themselves makes it worth the fact that they aren't always easy to see. They don't dive into the sand like a sandfish skink or a, a sand boa. They just start to vibrate and they simply sink into the sand like Artax into the swamp of sadness. The only difference is that this is really cool to see, you know, as opposed to the most devastating thing in cinematic history. But is this sinking, curly-tailed, demigorgon-faced little dragon with the schnoz of a snub-nosed monkey a good pet? And is it the best pet lizard for you? To figure this out, we will have to score the toad-headed agama based on our five categories, which are handleability, care, hardiness, availability, and upfront costs. When it comes to handleability, we give the toad-headed agama a score of 3 out of 5. To be honest, I don't really hold them or recommend holding them very often. I give them such a high score because they're very easy to hold, uh, basically like little bearded dragons. They're certainly nothing like sandfish skinks to hold, which are very, very slippery. Like sandfish, these have these cool little fringes on their toes, which certainly have something to do with moving on or through sand. And both live under the sand, but these guys are not swimmers like sandfish. As a result, it really seems like Crypsis and that crazy defensive display are their only real defenses. These are captive bred, so maybe wild caught would be more inclined to bite, but I haven't really seen that from these. They can run pretty fast if they want to, but I really haven't seen them even run away with much effect. If you pick one up, they really just seem to go along for the ride. I've also seen no indication that they can drop their curly little scorpion tails. And many agamids can't, so stands to reason that maybe they can't at all. They're relatively easy to hold, but this is a lizard that likes a lot of heat. They just don't seem to enjoy being handled at all. So I'm actually going to put this little girl back and uh, leave her there for the rest of this video. It's not hard but it's really not enjoyable for anyone involved. If you want a lizard like this that is better to handle, probably go with a Beardy or their smaller cousins, the Rankin's Dragon. Collared lizards could also be a great option. Or you could go straight for the ultimate, the Emerald Tree Skink, even though they're a more tropical species. And I should mention that toad-headed agamas are very fun to watch and interact with within the enclosure, so there's really no reason to get them out most of the time. When it comes to care, we give the toad-headed agama a score of 4 out of 5. I should preface this by saying that I'm talking about this species only, the secretive toad-headed agama, Phrenocephalus mystaceus. There are over 30 species of toad-headed agamas, and some are much more difficult to keep successfully. This, however, is the most common species that you will find in the pet trade. My trio here were sent to me recently from CNB Reptiles in Phoenix, Arizona. This is one of the greatest pet shops I have ever had the privilege of entering. I was able to attend their grand opening last year, and since then, they've only gotten better. They specialize exclusively in captive bred animals and have one of the best selections anywhere. And when this captive bred trio came into the shop, they contacted me to see if I would be willing to take them. 
I honestly have been wanting to talk to you guys about these since the first time I saw a picture of one. They're nuts. But until these three arrived, I had never seen one in person. And I can tell you that even for the most common species kept in captivity, information on their care is very limited. But what we do know about them is fairly straightforward. These guys come from the desert. And when I say desert, I don't always mean a sandy wasteland. But in this case, I mean a sandy wasteland. These guys come from a land, from a faraway place where the caravan camels roam where it's flat and immense and the heat is intense. It's barbaric, but to them, it's home. They're from way out there on the dunes. And that is essentially what you need to simulate. Sand. They need sand. That sand needs to be deep enough to bury themselves completely. They need a very hot basking spot at or above 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 49 degrees Celsius or 322 Kelvins. Ambient temperature should be around 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 30 Celsius, or 303 Kelvins. High intensity UVB is also required. Because they are small and largely sedentary, they don't need a huge enclosure. The fact that their ambient temperatures are also high also allows that enclosure to be somewhat smaller. I'm quarantining these guys in an Exoterra medium low, which seems adequate. I'll probably go a bit larger here in a few months. But I've never seen them appear as though they're looking for a way to get out or need more space to move around. At least until today when we put them up here on the table and got them all freaked out. But generally speaking, they're just sitting in one spot, usually buried. They're ambush predators. They'll sprint after food and the rest of the time they're just sitting in one place waiting for something to pass by. A shallow water bowl is necessary, but nothing that they will not be able to escape easily. And no hides, just deep sand. Theoretically, they may climb a bit, but I've never seen them do it, even though I put this little branch in there right under the basking light that they can climb on. They are very communal. Though I would not recommend keeping more than one male together, they seem to do better in groups. And their tail curls, crazy mouths, and chin spots are all used in their communication with one another, so having more than one is really fun anyway. And I do notice that the male He's the one with the little blue spot on his head. That's not actually part of their coloration. That was something done by their previous owner to let me know which one was the male and which two are the females. He is out most of the time, but the females are almost always buried. They're only out right now because we just moved their enclosure around and they're figuring things out. When it comes to food, they like insects, a broad diversity of insects. Dubia roaches seem to be one of their favorites and because dubia roaches don't tend to burrow into sand like they do other substrates, it's easier to feed them dubias than it is for any other animal I have. They also like crickets, beetle larvae like superworms and mealworms and hornworms. These are all things they will gladly accept. Basically, they like arthropods. Calcium and vitamin dusting is also likely very helpful for these animals. I'd like to take a moment just to say thank you to our patrons at Patreon who actually helped fund our trip to CNB Reptiles. It was an amazing trip and we saw some incredible things, caught some rattlesnakes, got to spend time with good friends like Dave Kaufman and Brian Cusco and Garrett Hartle and make this relationship with CNB Reptiles that made this video possible. It's just difficult to list all the ways that you help us. And of course, we have a lot of features as part of our way of saying thank you to all of you that support us. If you'd be interested in those features or just supporting incredible things like this in the future, please consider checking out our Patreon. When it comes to hardiness, again, speaking only for captive bred secretive toad-headed agamas, we give them a score of four out of five. This score would be considerably lower for wild caught and also for many of the other species that you could potentially see. In general, they seem to do pretty well. People are breeding them successfully and hopefully we here at Clint's Reptile Room can join that club soon as well. Mostly just make sure they're kept warm enough. When it comes to availability, you know, these are the first toad-headed agamas I have ever seen in my entire life. That said, I do see them listed for sale at times online. Many of those are likely wild-caught imports that I would frankly advise against, but they are out there. I would say find a breeder online and get on their waiting list, but we give them a one out of five for availability. 
When it comes to upfront costs, we give the toad-headed Agama a score of three out of five. These guys are not insanely expensive, but they're not cheap, and you should probably buy at least two of them. After that, their enclosure, lights, water bowl, and sand aren't crazy expensive. They do eat a lot of insects for a lizard this size, but that doesn't factor in here. And that is why, overall, we give the toad-headed Agama a score of 3.0 out of 5. This isn't a super cheap lizard. It's not great to handle. It's not easy to find. But that doesn't mean that they aren't totally worth having. If what you want is, well, a fairly unexceptional looking lizard that morphs into one of the craziest looking creatures in the world, like some sort of a reptilian Autobot, then the toad-headed Agama might just be the perfect pet lizard for you. And have you noticed that with all of these comparisons, we have never even likened them to toads? As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. It's barbaric, but to them, it's home. They're from way out there on the dunes. You held it together for a long time there, Jason. I was very impressed. <laughs> I love that. It's so cool.